So now I am so excited to take you to the, the Tukin Rescue Ranch. Hello. Hey. <laughs> hey, Andrea. Can you can you hear us? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, this is this is such an exciting stream. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm hoping that we might actually be able to see some toucans. Oh yeah, exciting. definitely. <laughs> sure we are. I mean, they're really important to our organization, so I'm definitely going to show the toucans. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the baby sloths. Oh my goodness. So okay, that, that's going to be like the grand finale. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Well, I'm so excited. Well, I'll, I'll, I will leave you now to show everyone the toucans because I'm sure everybody is itching to, to see them. Okay, so I will, I will leave now. And Oh, so you don't need to share your screen. You're going to be showing us in person. Okay, that's brilliant. Alrighty, I can't wait. This is so exciting. It's good to see you so excited. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the Toucan Rescue Ranch virtually. Uh, my name is Andrea. I'm one of the tour guides over here. I'm also a na manager of natural resources. Um, I have been working here since October and I've been loving every single day over here. Working with these animals is super inspiring. Uh, so even though I'm a guide over here, I get to work with them and to talk to people about all of these amazing animals. So for all of those who do not know about Toucan Rescue Ranch, we are a rescue center in a sanctuary located here in Costa Rica. So our main goal as a rescue center is to rescue, rehabilitate, and rewild as many animals as possible. All of the animals that come here, um, all of them are rescues. So we have to rescue them because of many different situations. For example, if they were hit by cars, electrocuted, which happens a lot with the sloths, um, if they were abandoned by their mothers, attacked by another animal, or just found there um, injured. They were either, um, they could be either confiscated by the police or surrendered by their previous uh, owners. Something really important about that is that here in Costa Rica, it is illegal to have wild animals as pets. So that's really, really important to know. That's of course really, really cool. But unfortunately there's still a lot of people who have wild animals as pets. So we still get a bunch of those animals. Of course, if they get the chance to go back into the wild then we rewild them. And if they cannot go back because of many reasons, for example, they don't have the abilities to hunt, uh, they don't know how to defend themselves, how to go and look for food, or even how to fly, then we will provide them with sanctuary for the rest of their lives. We're actually on the sanctuary side over here. We're going to go to the rescue center side in just a bit. And I'm going to show you guys some of our amazing residents over here. Actually, I see that the toucans are a bit camera shy right now because all of them were at the very front and now they have gone to the very end of the enclosure. Um, so while I switch my camera, just give me one second. There you go. <laughs> I am going to tell you guys a little bit about us. Toucan Rescue Ranch was started in 2004 by our amazing founder, Leslie. Uh, after she came back to Costa Rica, so she was born in the U.S., but she was raised here in Costa Rica when she was a kid until she was 15 years old. Then she went back home, uh, did a couple things over there. She studied occupational therapy and basically did her life over there. Then she came back to Costa Rica for one of her birthdays and she fell in love of Costa Rica again. And she was like, I definitely need to go to Costa Rica to live. Um, in the U.S., when, where she was, she was rescuing some macaws and parrots uh, that were surrendered by their previous owners. And so she basically started her rescue back in the U.S. Um, and then she came here in 2003, and while being on another rescue facility, she learned that macaws, out of many other species of birds, they are super popular in here. So everyone wants to rescue the macaws and everyone, every, everyone wanted to work with the macaws and with the toucans for example and other birds such as the owls not a lot of people wanted to work with them because they were not as popular and actually toucans can be really really popular I mean look at their colors they are super amazing birds <laughs> so over there she learned that Macaws did need her, her help, but maybe the toucans and other animals wanted her help even more. 
So she founded Toucan Rescue Ranch in 2004. And as the name says, we started rescuing toucans at the very beginning together with other species of birds. So let's talk a little bit about the toucans. Um, here in Costa Rica, we have six different species of toucans. Here at the ranch, we've had the pleasure to work with five of, five of those species. And right now we have four of those species. So of course, I don't even have to introduce these species. I'm sure that most of you have seen it. <laughs> so this is the rainbow bill toucan or the keel bill toucan, one of the most easily recognizable species of toucans and of course one of the most colorful ones. <laughs> this guy over here is trying to show his bill, his really, really large bill. <laughs> then if we go over here, we will see another rainbow bill toucan. This guy over here for some reason likes to dance sometimes, so you will see him hopping on the branch. Are you gonna do it? No? <laughs> then over here, if we go to this side, we will see our largest species of toucan. This is the yellow-throated toucan or the chestnut mandible toucan. <laughs> the largest species of toucan in Costa Rica and the second largest species of toucan in the world, followed by the toco toucan. So let's remember that toucans can only be found in Central and South America, nowhere else in the world, so these guys are pretty impressive. What many people don't know about the toucans is their diet. So every time we get a tour over here, we try to ask them if they know what toucans eat in the wild. So try to think for a, a little while, what do you think toucans eat in the wild? Do they just eat fruit? Do they eat fruit loops like many people think when they hold them captive? Or what do they eat? <laughs> These guys are really impressive because they are omnivores. So their main diet are fruits, but they can eat some other things such as insects, frogs, snakes, smaller mammals, smaller birds, eggs from other birds, you name it. <laughs> they eat a bunch of things. With those really, really large bills, <laughs> Hello. Uh, so with their large bills, they can help themselves reach for fruits or into hollow cavities on the trees to reach for the insects or for the eggs, for example. But they can also help them regulate their own body temperature. So toucans, they can, for example, on a hot day, they can send their blood flow all over their bodies. They open up their bill and let the cooler air cool themselves down a little bit. But if it was too cold or during the night when they're sleeping, what these guys do is that they send blood flow to their bill, they put it underneath their wing, and that way they can be a little warmer. <laughs> so that's an incredible adaptation these guys have. <laughs> if we go over here, we have uh, some other toucans over here. <laughs> these guys are medium-sized species of toucans. So we have gobbles over here who is a cooler Darasari. <laughs> and we have Scooby, who is a, um, um, <laughs> an Arasari, a Kusingo, <laughs> a fear revealed Arasari. So you can see that these guys look a little similar to each other. But some of the main differences is that the fear revealed Arasari, as you can see, have a more colorful bill. And they are slightly larger than the cooler Darasaris. <laughs> <laughs> These guys live on groups, <laughs> they have their own family hierarchy and everything, and they're really, really cool animals, <laughs> and they are also super playful. <laughs> and at least over here, they love to be like playing with leaves or with small sticks, playing with each other and <laughs> taking them everywhere on their enclosure, so they're pretty interesting birds. <laughs> if we keep going along, we might find um, some other species of animals that we have over here. We have around 300 different animals, um, individuals over here, and many, many different species. So we have otters, we have monkeys, we have parrots, macaws, you already saw the toucans, we have owls. But taking advantage that he's outside, <laughs> I am going to show you guys a species that I'm sure that is probably one of the first times you've ever heard of them, or at least seen them. So let me switch my camera again and introduce you guys to Hershey. <laughs> so Hershey is a Tyra, 
or what we call them here in Costa Rica, a tolomuco. <laughs> These guys are family to mustelids. So Hershey is family to otters, for example. <laughs> they have webbed feet and of course <laughs> they can swim, although they prefer to be a little more on the trees or on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> they are really good diggers over there. So he has lots of burrows on his enclosure. You can see that he has lots of branches all over his enclosure. And part of his enrichment is to keep on rebranching everything on his enclosure. So he will have more space. Uh, his branches will be on a different spot. <laughs> and that will, help him, uh, that will help him stimulate himself and, you know, climb a little more. We also put him lots of toys over here. So over there, there's a cardboard box or what was a cardboard box that we put him one of these days. Hey, Hershey. <laughs> so unfortunately, most of the reasons why we have to rescue these animals, um, most of the animals that we have over here is because they were kept as pets. So we have cats that were kept as pets. For example, our Ocelot Felicia and our Ancilla Taboo. Hershey was also being kept as a pet and in a hotel, so just imagine. And the owner of that hotel told us that he thought that Hershey was a puppy at the very beginning. Uh, but that story doesn't make sense at all because he locked Hershey on one of his bedrooms and started charging people money to take pictures with this puppy. So of course, he definitely knew that he was not a puppy. And unfortunately, that, that's something that happens in many, many cases and with many, many animals. <laughs> now we are on the rescue center side and here to be somewhere around this tree, already saw one. <laughs> so, let me go over here. <laughs> okay, let me switch my camera again. <laughs> and hopefully you will get to see Kronos because he's at the very, very top of the tree. Kronos, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so one of the things we are most recognized for here at Tuken Rescue Ranch is in our amazing rewilding program for the baby sloths. <laughs> so as I told you at the very beginning, when we started Toucan Rescue Ranch, we started rescuing basically birds such as toucans. Um, but then in 2007, everything changed with Leslie because we got to rescue our first sloth over here. So our first ever rescued sloth was Millie. She is now 14 years old. <laughs> Unfortunately for her, she wasn't able to go back into the wild because <laughs> she didn't have the chance to. Back then in 2007, people thought that there was no chance that a sloth could go back into the wild or that we could rewild them. So for a couple of years, people just had to keep on all of these baby sloths on their rescues. But then we started our amazing project called Saving Sloths Together, together with the other rescue center, the Sloth Institute. And we have been able to rewild many, many baby sloths throughout the years. <laughs> Kronos is one of the wildest babies I have ever seen here, or at least that I have met uh, on the time that I've been working here. <laughs> As you can see, he is a two-fingered baby sloth. <laughs> he is enjoying these almond leaves over here that we have for him. <laughs> then I have another baby over here. He was actually camouflaging. I didn't see him at the very beginning. <laughs> but we have Muffin over here. Muffin looks way different than Kronos, and that's because he is a three-fingered sloth. <laughs> so some of the main differences between both species is, of course, on their number of fingers they have on their hands because both the species have three toes on their feet. Also, these guys have like a black mask on their faces and they have a whole different diet. So you can see that Muffin here is eating some other species of leaf. 
This is a guarumo or a cecropia tree. <laughs> These guys love the cecropia tree. Whereas the two finger sloths prefer to eat almond tree, mango leaves, poro leaves, um, and many, many other species uh, of plants. <laughs> Some other differences is that the three finger sloths are a bit slower than the two finger sloths. Believe me, working with the, with the two finger sloths, um, I have seen the vets and the keepers like work with them and whenever they need treatment, it's like a total chaos <laughs> because they can get really, really aggressive. These guys are not that aggressive, but they definitely do not like to be held. <laughs> so sometimes if we have a sloth in the clinic, especially one of the rescued adults, if they come here because they were electrocuted, for example, is that we might need at least four people to handle that sloth. So there needs to be one person holding on their neck so the sloth will not bite. And two people will be, having, will be uh, holding on their hands and feet so they will not scratch. And depending on how aggressive they are, somebody needs to be holding on their belly as well so they will not turn. <laughs> Something also pretty impressive, and thank you, Muffin, for showing us, is that these guys can turn their heads up to 270 degrees, just like the owls, for example. <laughs> the two finger sloths cannot do that. And something pretty interesting about them is that you can tell males and females apart with the three finger sloths quite easily, at least when they are adults. <laughs> when they are babies, it's not that easy, just by looking at them. So. All of their organs are internally. And so one of the ways you can identify a male from a female in the wild from a three finger sloth is that the three finger sloths males will have like a black patch of hair over here. And the females will have just like this line over here. <laughs> just like Muffin. We think Muffin is a female and we have another three toed baby but I, I see that he is at the very, very top. His name is Kamalito, and I think that Kamalito is probably a male, but we still need to check out. <laughs> so about our amazing rewilding program that we have for the babies, um, we have to rescue babies. We do not breed them over here. We have to rescue them because of many different situations. So for example, it can be that the baby was abandoned by its mother, that it fell from the tree, uh, it was hit with his mother. Um, and maybe if there's someone passing by and they see a baby on the ground, they will think that the baby was abandoned and then they will take the baby to a rescue center. Sometimes they didn't even need to take the baby to a rescue center. So um, and that's what we call a false rescue over here. And then when we rescue them, depending on their age, we put them on different stages. For example, if we receive a premature baby or a newborn baby, we put them in the nursery. Over here, we have incubators for the baby so they can develop fully. Then when they are around one to three months of age, they stay on preschool. The nursery and preschool are with Leslie. She's the one that takes care of the babies. So in these two stages, they basically learn basic behaviors. For example, how to climb, Leslie tries to put like some leaves above them so they can go and look for their own food and stuff like that. When they turn four months of age, they go to elementary school, which is on the slot house. We have like a porch over there with a structure, kind of like one of those structures that you see over there. So it's like a huge playground for baby sloths. Over there, they get to climb, to go and look for their own food and stuff like that. And depending if it's like a really, really sunny and bright day, we'd also take them here, um, which is part of the, this is like an old stage area. Um, so we bring babies over here. Sometimes we bring the adults over here. Um, you can see that they cannot escape through here because there's like a barrier here. Um, so they will be safe over here. And here they also learn some basic behaviors. With Kronos, the two finger sloth, he is way up top right now. <laughs> we do put him here every once in a while because he has a really wild spirit. He prefers to be sleeping in a wild position or in a tree on, or in a branch rather than on a blanket, which is super funny. So on the sloth porch, we have some hammocks and blankets for the babies for them to cuddle on and to sleep. But Kronos definitely doesn't like to be over there. 
<laughs> and he's over there at the very, very top. <laughs> then when they turn seven months of age, they come here to the rescue center side um, on, on middle school, where they spend a little more time over here on the outdoors. Then when they turn a year old, they go to high school. And eventually, when they turn a year and a half old, they will go to college. <laughs> so college, it sounds funny, but it is basically the time where, where they get to acclimate a little more to go back into the wild. So we have another property called the release site where we take the babies over there. <laughs> we put them on a really, really nice enclosure with a more natural environment. And over there, they get to learn a little more how to be wild sloths. If you guys go and follow us on our social media platforms, you will see that a couple of weeks ago, we did a huge event um, rewilding some of the babies we've had for a couple of years. And you should definitely go and watch that. <laughs> So, I don't know, Eleanor, if there are any questions from the public or anything that you might want to ask or you want to know about. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe that we are looking at baby sloths right now. This is like <laughs> the best day of my entire life. I can't believe it. When you mentioned it, it was like, also oh, baby sloths. I was like, what? That's so cool. Oh, my goodness. And I, I love your enthusiasm and, and like bubbliness and, and the amount of knowledge you have. Oh, oh my goodness. What, what an amazing talk. Thank you so much for coming and, and speaking to us. Um, so, sure. so, yeah, I... Yeah, I had I had some questions. So, so, so what's your favorite part of, of working at the ranch? Definitely educating the public. Well, I mean, one of my favorite parts is working with animals. Ever since I was a young kid, I have always wanted to work with animals. Uh, but same, I really like to educate the public about all of these animals, to show them to them, and to basically talk about their threats and how we can help them, even from our houses. So we can be really, really easy. <laughs> and so for the people listening you know what would you think the top things are that you can you know what would you recommend them to to kind of help these kind of animals okay well definitely do not keep them as pets <laughs> no <laughs> wild animal is meant to be kept as a pet um so that's a first then it can be as easy as not following people on social media who have these animals as pets or that promote having them as pets, or where you can go and pay to play with a baby animal, being a baby lion, baby tiger, baby bear, it doesn't matter the species, but do not go over there and do not support those people. Because that way you're actually supporting the black, the black market trade and the pet trade. So that's an easy way to, to like to do. And also support like companies that do not destroy the environment and yeah, <laughs> things like that. Just know where the, your food is coming from, where the animals are coming from, and definitely do research about the places that you want to support. That's that's very, very good advice. And can I ask more about the, I love what you said earlier about them going to different schools. I just think that's the most adorable thing. <laughs> when, when, you, when you finally release them, like, how do, how do you feel? Do you feel like Super, there must be like a real mix of emotions to be releasing an animal you've cared for for so long. How do you feel when that happens? <laughs> well, I am sure there are a mix of emotions. Um, I have never been personally on a rewilding event, but I have always followed them on social media. But it is also like a mix of, of emotions. So with the last rewilding, we had Oatmeal the Sloth, the Two Finger Sloth. She came here in late 2019 from an electrocution. And there were times where the vets thought that she had no chance because of her injuries. So she overcame everything and more. And not, right now she is living back into the wild. And it was super emotional because she was one of the first slots that I met working here. Uh, so seeing her going back into the trees over there on the forest was like, it was, I was really, really happy to see her that she overcame everything. <laughs> Wow, what a what a great story! Oh my goodness, look at look at him eating that leaf. He seems to be having a really great time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, and, and so how did you know? You've clearly got this like really real passion for conservation and what you're doing. You know, how did you end up getting into the field? Is it something you've like always been kind of working towards, or how did you end up doing what you do now? 
So yeah, as I told you, I've always wanted to work with animals on a zoo, uh, like in a really good zoo, a rescue center and or sanctuary. So when I saw the opportunity to become a tour guide over here, I was like, yes, this is my chance. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's basically how I got in here. I have learned so many things over here. Uh, the vets, they like to share their knowledge. So even though I'm not a vet, I get to learn lots of things from that field and how to work with these animals. And hopefully I can get to work with them like a little closer sometime um, or specialize in something about like, you know, animal behavior or enrichment or stuff like that, because I really, really like those things. <laughs> And, and so what do you think, what do you see as the kind of next steps, you know, both for you as a conservationist, but also as the, the, the ranch, you know, are, are they kind of got anything in the pipeline for the kind of coming few years? Well, for sure. <laughs> we definitely want to keep on growing. We, of course, want to keep on rescuing more and more animals. Right now with the pandemic, it has been a little difficult with that because, of course, we rely on funding from donations and from on-site tours and stuff like that. Uh, so we definitely need more support on that so we can work a little more on more projects, um, you know, building more enclosures, um, trying to work a little more on the enclosure that we have over here and, you know, just giving a little more to these animals and hopefully growing a lot more on the upcoming years. So if you guys are interested in working with us or supporting us, you can always go to our website, toucanrescuerancher.org. You will see that if you cannot come here to Costa Rica to do an on-site tour, you can always do a virtual tour. Uh, we, the guides, will take you everywhere on our rescue center. We will see you. We will um, show you guys the baby sloths and the other animals that we have over here. You can always help us on the Amazon wish list. That's a really fun way on how to support us. Um, and yeah, donating, uh, sponsoring one of the animals and stuff like that. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, that sounds like a really so so everybody go go check out their website if you get the chance. And yeah, that's oh what what an amazing, what an amazing place that you work in and 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 just what oh my goodness, look at look at that little guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must be really hard for you to leave at the end of the day, you know, when you've got those little guys to uh <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's so adorable. Oh wow. <laughs> Wow, what a cool job you have. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Wow. And, you know, again, thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing. And thank you so much for taking all this time to come and uh, <laughs> come and talk to us. Look at his little face. Hello, Dennis. <laughs> oh, <are> you... <laughs> He's now fighting with his rope. <laughs> Is he trying to get to you? Is he trying to show up to the camera? <laughs> I really don't know. Maybe he's getting annoyed. So I'm definitely going okay. outside right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. All righty. Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you go because I. We've got a, a new speaker in in a minute. Yeah. But like, sure. Oh, thank you just so much though for taking your time to talk to us. This has been just so yeah, well, exciting. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for having us and always for supporting us. And be sure to check on our colleague, our veterinarian Anna. She's going to speak tomorrow, and uh, so stay tuned. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, everyone, you've got to make sure you stay tuned for that one. And thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so sure. much. Bye-bye. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye. You too. Bye.